morning and welcome to this Facebook Live here from WHO, the European Region. Uh, I'm here with Dr Hans Klu, who has been uh, elected the uh, Regional Director nominee as a result of the, uh, from the 53 member states on Tuesday. Uh, you'll be replacing, uh, oh sorry, succeeding Susanna Jakob who, uh, right. who had a 10 year tenure until here recently and uh, once everything is confirmed you will take up position in, uh, in February 2020. Right. So if I may start, first of all, what is your vision for health in the European region in the next five years? Right. So my vision could be best described as that I dream of a society where no one is left behind, which is fully in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. It also would mean that in the WHO European region, all the major government policies are giving a place to health so that all people of all ages are enabled to live healthy lives and coming even a step further down, it would mean that in the WHO European region we have both people-centred and financially sustainable healthcare and public health services. Great. And the other day you touched upon uh, in your speech about providing a compass for health yes. and a toolbox to, uh, to implement the SDGs to the Member States. Could you elaborate a little bit more yes. on that, please? Yes, right. This came out, in fact, I'm the first candidate in history which visited all the countries to have a very honest dialogue with the Minister of Health, the national administrations, the foreign affairs, the partners. What do you think now of the WHO Regional Office for Europe? What works well, what not, and what do you expect from a future region director and his or her staff? And if I have to make a kind of a summary, a very short summary of all those 49 country visits, number one is that countries would like to see WHO providing a compass to the future. What are the biggest challenges? What are the main health policies that are to be developed and implemented? But at the same time, not to stop there. In fact, some ministers were telling me WHO has to get real. There are very concrete problems in the countries. So it's not enough to talk, to have concepts and frameworks. WHO has to be able, through collecting best practices in all the countries to develop tools and instruments. How can countries accelerate towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals? For example, a topic which was touched upon by all 53 ministers or administration I met was access to affordable medicines, whether in the western part, the central part of the region or the eastern part access to affordable medicines, be it innovative medicines, innovative cancer medicines, or the more older drugs like anti-TB, HIV, hepatitis C, is very, very hot issue for the countries. Now, what can WHO do to support our member states on those issues? Great, and um, in your opinion, what are the major health challenges that the, Europe, uh, the WHO European region is facing? Right, this is a huge question. I always say, it depends on where you sit, right? If you look at it from an epidemiological point of view, you would say, of course, the biggest disease burden are non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases means chronic diseases like diabetes, cancer, right? Cardiovascular diseases. But if I'm a father with a child with leukemia, right? This is the most important health challenge for me as a father that I can get my child cured or at least live as long as possible in equality. So if we say leaving no one behind, it means we have to take into account the regional context, but also the country specific context, the sub-national context and ultimately the real issues that people face. So in that sense, rather than to tell this or one, two, three health challenges, we WHO have to be ready to be agile, to adapt to what the countries are asking us. Great. And uh, so what are the next steps for you now over the, over the course of the next few months? Yes, this is the most frequently asked question I'm getting now, including from my family. So, two things. The two things which matter to me as a person and a professional. One is the family. I need really to get a break with the family now, which will do the last two weeks of October, when traditionally in Denmark there are the autumn school holidays, because this has been a non-stop marathon for me, 
to all the countries the last six months. And number two, what matters for me, is primary health care. I always say, family is the cornerstone of well-being, just like primary health care is the cornerstone of people-centered health systems. Concrete, it means that Saturday I'm taking the plane to New York because I will have there a role in the United Nations high-level meeting on universal health coverage, where heads of state, Minister of Health, will put this issue on the top of the political agenda in New York. And there will be a very important side event by the government of Kazakhstan on primary health care. Because we say no UHC without PHC. Great. And uh, just a little bit about yourself. Uh, what, do you, what do you enjoy? What do you spend your time doing outside of, outside of work? Right. <laughs> I must say that I enjoyed the last six months tremendously. I got a lot of advice, as I was telling in my acceptance speech, it's very important to listen to advice and sometimes to ignore advice. Now the advice that I did not ignore was an advice who told you have to enjoy it. This has been a very exceptional moment in my life. I'm extremely grateful to my country, Belgium, for the unwavering support I got, both from health and foreign affairs, and to the fantastic hospitality of the countries, the partners and the people. Now, what I enjoy in general, I told you already, is family and primary health care. Personally, is to do sports and to relax while gardening. Great. And uh, how do you bring healthy activities into your daily life? You've already touched upon the sports yes. and, the, and the gardening, but... Right. This is a very easy question in Copenhagen, which is a healthy city. We are very grateful to the Danish government for providing such a wonderful hospitality and environment. I will give one anecdote. When I arrived here 10 years ago, there was a new Danish Minister of Health who arrived to the office and we had the red carpet. And I was asked, as the newcomer, right, as it usually goes, to wait for the minister. I was waiting, waiting, then one gentleman knocked me on the shoulder from behind and asked where is the office of the region director. And I excused myself because I was waiting for the minister. And he told with the helmet on, but I'm the Minister of Health. So then I understood the cycling culture in this city, in this beautiful country, and also the modesty. So I'm biking in the morning, whatever the weather, and biking in the evening. So if I'm busy, it is ingrained in our daily routine. Great, and uh, I think we have a question from uh, one, of the, one of the audience here. It's um, basically to do with partners. What is your message to the partners and uh, how will you engage them? Right, great question. People who follow my social media have been seeing that I have always tried to reach out whenever I could to the partners during my campaign. But independent of the campaign, I have been working in some of the most challenging places on earth. In the prisons in Siberia, in the Democratic People Republic of North Korea, in Myanmar when we had the Cyclone Nargis. And what I learned there is that I do not believe in isolation. For me, partnership is not a matter of goodwill. It's not something to do. Partnership is a ethical duty. The resources are few, the challenges are huge. And WHO has to understand that today we are only one of the many players in the global health arena. But what differentiates WHO from the rest is we have the normative mandate. Our agenda is only health for all. And that gives us the moral authority to be a fantastic convening agency. And that is the key of partnership. And partnership has ultimately to make a difference at the country level. And there, for 25 years, I have been a man of the field. And I have many examples, working with tuberculosis patients to reach the unreached in the hilly areas, right? Or to work with the Commonwealth of Independent States to strengthen the public health workforce. Or to work with the European Centre of Disease Control to give the same messages to the countries in times of crisis. So those personally, professional experiences has formed my vision that partnership is a ethical duty. And that's why we decided from the very beginning that the motto of my campaign was United Action for Better Health. Great. Um, I think unless we have any more questions from the audience, that's all we have from the moment. I mean, is there anything 
else we haven't t touched upon now, so we have a little bit of time uh, that, that you'd like to mention? This sort I think the questions were uh, very, very comprehensive, Greg, but it's maybe a message to everyone who is listening now and in the future that United Action for Better Health in Europe means it's everyone's responsibility. The agencies are there to provide the service to the member states. The member states can do a lot of creating the enabling environment, but if you want to tackle the biggest killers and to move from a culture of disease to a culture of health, people also need to be empowered to make the healthy decisions. And that will be a priority. One of the first priorities if a common board is to create a cross-cutting behavioral change unit. Because there is one determinant which is important for all events and diseases, whether communicable disease, non-communicable disease, or outbreaks and emergencies. And it is human behavior. We know that human beings depart from rationality to sometimes irrational behavior for many reasons. But if we take advantage of behavioral economics, of sociology, of anthropology, we can create evidence and then turn it into policy and advice for countries, really to advise on how to help the population to nudge them towards a healthy behavior. And I think that's the biggest challenge we face. How do we ultimately create societies where healthy choices are the easy choices?